Last night, good morning, my dear. Well, at the back, I was thinking of the song. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Because Christ is risen. Amen. Um, before the end of um, 1999, going back in time a bit, you know, the world braced itself for the coming of the new millennium. And uh, this is what they call the Y2K. If you can still remember that, the year 2000. And the world, they hired the most experienced computer expert there is in the planet in anticipation of what would be that simple change in time, that simple change of year would impact, especially the computer world. Right? And uh, because the files and the data, they did not know what would be the impact to those files because we restore those informations in the files in the computer servers. And those that everything has to do with computers. Now, when the clock ticks at exactly 12 midnight, New Year's Eve from 1999 going to year 2000, by God's grace, nothing that was anticipated happened. Right? And little did we know that just a few months after that, the computer world would change forever. Anybody have any clue what went down May 4, 2000? It's almost 20 years ago, and <clears throat> this was the time when the infamous I love you virus, or the love bug, was first sent via email. Do you still remember, you still recall the I love you virus? Yeah. That was May 4, 2000. And that changed the cyber world, that changed the world of computer and that I love you virus it comes in an email with the word I love you as its subject and <clears throat> once open your files will be at risk it will be corrupted or it will be deleted all major files your JPEG will be deleted now it is spread quickly all over the world in less than 24 hours, it reaches many countries. And why it was so widespread, it is because it is embedded in an email. And most of the time, most corporate world uses the MS or Microsoft Outlook. Microsoft Outlook as its uh, uh, email management application. So when you open that file, it is going to copy the email address in those Microsoft Outlook address of yours, and it will be sent to those addresses. That's why in less than 10 days, in less than 10 days, most of the corporate world, most countries were infected by this I love you virus or the love bug, and it spread to about, they say, 10 to 15 percent of computers in the world, 45 million computers, and it costs about 10 billion in U.S. dollars. It costs about 10 billion in U.S. dollars in damages in just about 10 days. Can you imagine? In just about 10 days. So a manhunt ensued, and <clears throat> they found out soon that the person behind this I love you virus was a college student in the Philippines. Yep, Philippine made, only in the Philippines. <laughs> Philippine made, <clears throat> made by a fellow Filipino. Though it caused so much damage, that according to one website, according to uh, techtarget.com, and I quote, on a positive note, 
The virus created a fundamental shift in the cybersecurity landscape. It also forced companies and security professionals to start thinking more seriously about enterprise security, as well as user security awareness and education, especially around social engineering, spam, and phishing, unquote. And just two months after that, after the incident, the Philippine Congress, they enacted what we call, what we now call the e-commerce law. Now, because of that, I love you virus. So it's an antagonist, but some said, or some says that uh, it awakens the, the world about cyber security. Now, a thousand years ago, a thousand years ago, a kind of virus spread like wildfire. Mm -hmm. It is called I love you virus as well. Thousand of years ago, it is called I love you virus, but not that kind of virus that will have your files lost. No. But the kind of virus that saves. Not the kind of virus that destroys, but the kind of virus that restores. It saves lives, restores relationships. And this morning, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, we're going to talk about this virus. And it is God's love, a contagious virus. In our study, uh, every Wednesday in the book of Daniel, we learned that God planned and purposed everything. There was no accident. There was no accident. So when God created man, he created man with a need for the creator. There will be that void in man's heart that only the Almighty can fill. <clears throat> in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, according to the scripture, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He also planted eternity in man's heart and mind, which means a divinely implanted sense of purpose working through the ages which nothing under the sun but only God and God alone can satisfy. So that's the void that's in man that only the Lord can satisfy. Now God knew that man would eventually seek out his own path. God knew that man would go on his sinful way, that man would cut the tie with the Savior, that man would severe that wonderful relationship with God. And God knew that this will bring sorrow to all of us. This God, and God knew that this will bring brokenness to all of us. And God knew that this will bring death to all of us. But, you know, God being the God that he is, already planned a remedy. He planned it from the beginning. He planned the remedy from the beginning, and that remedy is love. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, and anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. You see, <clears throat> God just cannot take this sitting down. God cannot take it sitting down and see his creation being broken. God cannot take this sitting down and look at his creation suffering and eventually go down to the path of hell. No. Why? Because that's not him. That's not who God is. And in the verse, God is love. He just can't take it because he will go against himself. It is with him where love originates. So according to this verse, he made sure that not only he made his presence felt, but this time, even his presence seen by all. 
that in this love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him, so that you and I might live through Him. You see, His love, it becomes visible. His love becomes tangible. And it is through our Master. It is through your Master, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now in verse 10, it says, God qualify the sending of His Son. In 1 John 4, verse 10, it qualifies in this love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us. He qualifies why He sent His Son for us. You see, God sending His Son, Jesus, has nothing to do whether we love Him or not. But it's all about His love to us. You know, it was planned from the very beginning. And it, there's no other perfect way to do it than to sacrifice His own beloved Son so that our relationship with Him can be restored. You see, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, we are not saved because Jesus carried the cross. We're not. We are not saved because Jesus was pierced at His side. We are not. We are saved because Jesus died on the cross, bearing all our sins, all our shame with Him. You see, it says there, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation has twofold. One that involves appeasing, appeasing the wrath of God, the anger of God, and the other one is the reconciliation, our reconciliation to the Almighty. It is twofold. To appease the wrath of God and to restore our broken relationship with our Father, with our Lord. There is no amount of sacrifice or gifts that man can offer to appease the wrath of God. We cannot give anything to appease that anger of God. We are supposed to spend eternity in hell because we are totally incapable of holding up the justice of God. But lo and behold, God made a way for all of us. The only, the only acceptable way of appeasing God can only be made by God Himself alone. And that's where Him, being the God of love that He is, He sacrificed His only begotten Son for you and I, who came into the world in human flesh to be the perfect sacrifice for sin of the people and to reconcile us with himself. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, therefore it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, in every way human, talking about Jesus Christ, like his brothers and like sisters, so that he could be our merciful, he could be our faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away my sin our sins that could take away the sins of the people. Now, this love of God and what it does to a person, you know, the forgiveness of our sins, the restoration of our broken relationship, the restoration of that once wonderful relationship with God is what makes it so contagious that people, people around the world want to have it. You know, but first thing first, we need to understand this. We need to understand that we are sinners. We need to understand that we are broken individuals. That we are a dirty rag that needs cleansing. We need to come to that reality and accept without a shadow of a doubt and without hesitations that we indeed are sinners and that we indeed need the blood of Christ to cleanse us from our own from our all filthiness. Jesus, in his early ministry, he thought about repentance. In his early ministry, that's what Jesus thought about. He thought about repentance. 
bringing to attention to the people that there's evil in us. There's evil in all of us that they follow the way of Satan rather than follow the way of God and that they need to turn away from it and that we need to come into terms with God. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Unless I repent, I will perish. Make no mistake about it. Now, this was the first demand of our Lord Jesus Christ. This was the first demand of our Lord's ministry. It is a call for repentance. A call for repentance, you know, it means a call for a radical change. A radical change, an inward change towards God. It is a radical inward change towards that restoring relationship towards God and eventually having a relationship, a good relationship with man. Because as we all know, repentance is not only turning away. It is not turning away from our sins. Repentance, it embraces also. It embraces a new life. We do not only repent because we want to turn away from our sins. We, all, we also repent because we want to turn away from our sins and we want to embrace a new life with Christ. We turn away from our sins because we want to face the Lord and walk towards Him. That is true repentance. We not only turn our back from our sins, we turn our backs from our sins and we draw closer to God. We want to embrace what God loves and we want to hate what God hates. And we want to embrace that new life with Him. And we want to have to restore that broken relationship with Him. That, my brothers and sisters and friends, what true repentance really means. True repentance is a radical change. It's a new life, a new behavior that we are not accustomed to. For example, people are not accustomed to when Jesus said in his Beatitudes, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, you turn to the other cheek also. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus says, you love the unloving. Jesus taught us to forgive. Jesus taught us the way of humility. These are the radical change that Jesus wants you and I to embrace once we repent. Because Jesus' first demand in his ministry is that we all truly repent of our sins. And this, among others, is what is truly encapsulated in the meaning of the word repentance. Jesus spoke this command extensively to all who would listen. But unfortunately, and yes, this message of our Lord Jesus Christ, it echoed. It echoed wherever he goes. But unfortunately, many got angry at him. They were so angry at his message because they felt guilty. And with pride in their hearts, they did not accept it. They did not accept his way. That's why they had him crucified. But the others who heard this message of repentance of our Lord Jesus Christ, they felt the guilt. They listened. They were stung and they were pricked in their hearts. In all the humility, they accepted this new teachings, this new way of life that Jesus taught. And they repented. They turned away from their sins and followed the Lord of our Jesus. Uh, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, because brethren and friends, if one is telling the truth, then nothing else matters except to conform our lives to that revealed truth. At one point in his life, Zacchaeus, he did just that. When he learned of the truth, he conformed his life to the truth. Now, probably heard about the message of our Lord Jesus Christ and seeing the brokenness in him when he learned that Jesus would be coming over 
to his town he made sure that jesus that who would that he would have that time to meet our lord and savior jesus christ then jesus uttered these wonderful words to him today salvation has come to this house isn't that wonderful that when the time when we are all broken that when the time when i was a sinner someone came to me someone did came to all of us and shared the gospel and i remember we remembered that time and we re-echoed these words of our lord jesus christ today salvation has come to all of us salvation has knocked on our doors and we are saved because of the blood of our lord and savior jesus christ and for sure zacchaeus was so happy he was so glad that he met and he invited Jesus Christ into his house. But you see, but while Zacchaeus was so happy receiving that message of our Lord Jesus Christ, the people outside of his house, they were murmuring. They were murmuring that Jesus had gone into the house of a sinner. Instead of looking at themselves being broken, being a sinner that they are, and needing a savior, they murmured. And they said to themselves, Jesus had come, had gone to a sinner's house. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus met a broken man, a man with leprosy, in the book of Mark chapter 1. And this man begged Jesus to heal him. Jesus was moved with compassion. Jesus was moved with love. Jesus reached out to him and touched him. And Jesus said, I am willing. I am willing. Those wonderful words of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he took up that cross, Jesus said, I am willing. Be healed. Instantly, the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. And after that, if you will read it, continue reading, Jesus gave this man a stern warning. He told this man not to tell anyone what happened except for some specific people. But this man, whose leprosy was healed, he cannot contain himself. He went out and spread the word, telling about Jesus, because Jesus was so moved with love and compassion that this man cannot contain himself. He went out and began speaking about this Jesus who loved him and who had compassion and, on him. And as a result, a large crowd followed Jesus wherever he go. Because these people, hearing about what he did, they wanted to have that same love. They wanted to have that same compassion that this man with leprosy received. Now, same thing happened when Jesus healed a deaf and mute man in Mark chapter 7. When this man was healed, he cannot keep himself from talking. He cannot keep himself from spreading about Jesus so that others might be healed as well. You see, these people, they just keep on talking and talking about Jesus. The genuine care, the genuine compassion, the genuine love brought about by Jesus Christ that they received was so contagious that they needed to share it to someone that they needed to tell to everyone they come across with so that these people, they too, can receive and experience Jesus Christ. And at the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, a multitude gathered. A multitude gathered around Peter and the apostles. Peter told them about Jesus, how Jesus was prophesied as the coming Savior, and how people treated him cruelly, with cruelty. Peter and the, the, the apostles talk about Jesus Christ to them, how they treated him with cruelty and finally giving him that death penalty via crucifixion. Now, the people having heard all of this, they were convicted. Many of them were convicted in their sins. They were pricked to their hearts. They saw their brokenness. They saw 
their sins. And they needed the forgiveness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so they asked the most important question of all. Brothers, what shall we do? I hope this message this morning would echo throughout. And those who are not yet saved would ask the very same question that this multitude asked Peter and the apostle. Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. You see, people only accepted the word repent. Until this very moment, people only listen to the word repent, but they do not want to be baptized into Christ. That is so unfortunate. In Acts 2.41, it says those who accepted this message, they were baptized. And how many were added? 3,000 were added. And in Acts chapter 4, they arrested them, the apostles. And since it was already evening, they put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of men who believed now totaled 5,000. Wow. Can you believe it? The love of God is so contagious. From 3,000, in just a couple of days, they totaled 5,000. 5,000 men accepted the Lord because of that love that God had upon those people and until this very moment to all of us, to you and I. In Acts chapter 5, 14 to 16, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Probably, it was never mentioned in this verse and in the, in, in the next verses to come, in the next chapter to come, it was never said how many accepted. I was thinking so many people began accepting the Lord. And in this verse, more and more men, from 3,000, they totaled 5,000. And who knows, they totaled down to 10,000, to 15,000. Because the people, the apostles, and those who accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, they were so infected by the virus of our Lord, by this God's love that they cannot contain themselves but keep on going and going and spreading the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the message of repentance, the message of salvation. That's why they grew even, even when they were arrested, even when they were put in jail. Those who were outside, they cannot contain themselves, but they keep on going and going because God's love, my dear brothers and friends, are so contagious. In Acts chapter 5, 18 to 20, they arrested again the apostles and put them in public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought him out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people about this new life. You know, because the disciples of our Lord were growing in numbers, the priests, the high priests and other officials began to be jealous. And they have them arrested so as to contain them and stop them from preaching. But you know, even though being put in prison, it did not deter the man of God from preaching. Once they got out, they were stubborn. Once they got out, they went back again unto where people were and teaching about the new life with Christ. You see, prison cannot contain them. Prison cannot contain this love virus that they had. They need to spread it. You see, 
Not that those priests and those high officials were only jealous. They were also afraid that this so-called Christianity movement would topple the government and take control of it, thinking that it will be like a revolt against the government. But a learned man, a learned man by the name of Gamaliel in our scripture reading in Acts chapter 5, verse 39, he said, but if it is from God, you will not be able to stop this man. See, if this is from God, he said, you will only find yourself fighting against God. Amen. That's how infectious God's love is. That's, that's how powerful God's love is. Is that nobody, no man in this age and in the age to come could ever stop this virus from spreading because they will be only fighting, not with man, but with God. You see, no matter how they suppress the disciples and the other in preaching Jesus' name, they will never succeed because God was working in those people and continue to work in all of you. God is working in your heart right now. Even when the apostles were beaten, when they were beaten and ordered not to speak in the name of Jesus, verse 41 says, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. You see, they cannot just hide this new life in Christ. It impacted their life so dramatically. Their daily preaching and their daily fellowship with the brethren, it becomes their social life. And the street, it becomes their second home. And after Stephen was killed, in Acts chapter 7, in Acts chapter 8, Saul, the apostle, Saul began to destroy the church. Now, the brethren at that time, instead of running and hiding, they were running away from Saul, but they continued to preach the good news wherever they went. They abused that opportunity to spread the gospel. The persecution may have been a blessing in disguise after all. In Acts chapter 8, on that great day, on that a day, on that day, a great persecution broke against the church in Jerusalem. Those who had been scattered, they preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah. You see that new life they found in our Lord Jesus Christ, it was so contagious. It is just like a grass fire that started with just a simple spark. And soon after, it rages on. It swoops across the meadows. It swoops across the forest. And everywhere where the wind blew, either left to right, it was spreading. Just a small spark. My dear brothers and sisters, just a small spark. That's all that was needed. And that small spark is right here in front of us. That small spark, oh, sorry, it's not right there. That small spark is that bread and that cup. That was the small spark, and that is God's love. Every Sunday, every Sunday, we commemorate, we remember that God's love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do it. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after, after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We are to remember, my dear brothers, sisters, we are to remember Jesus Christ. We are to remember God. We are to remember the Holy Spirit, the tree and God. It is a reminder that we must not forget this love. God have on us. In remembrance of me is about love. That very week, or that every week, as we take the cup, as we take the bread, we remind ourselves and manifest to the world that we are proclaiming God's love that brought Jesus to die on the cross, bearing our sins and shame. The Lord's death, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, is about love. You see, God's love was so infectious that it reaches us. It reaches us, and it will reach the unborn. It will reach the next generation to come. God's love was so contagious that Christians in the Bible, they defy all odds. Acts 5.41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin. They were rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. In Acts chapter 8, verse 8, so there was great joy in the city when they have heard the good news. There was great joy in the city. Can you imagine the apostles? Can you imagine the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ being imprisoned and being beaten and being flogged? And after that, they were rejoicing. They went out of the prison rejoicing. Yes, Lord. Can you imagine? After being beaten by the officials, after being in prison, and when they were released, they were jumping for joy. They were rejoicing. Why? Because they have again the opportunity to share the gospel. They have again the opportunity to share that message of new life. That message of repentance that our Lord once shared and taught. You see, the love bug, the I love you virus, it infected the cyber world and it cost billions. You know, it will be so much amazing if we will maximize the full potential of the cyber world to spread the message of the Lord, to spread God's love. And it will not cause damages, but it will restore broken relationship. Now, I want all of us to remember that time when we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. You still remember that time when you were baptized into Christ. And after that, we were all enthusiastic, right? Because we found a new relationship with Christ. At that time, I could remember I was at in, at cloud nine. I was at cloud nine at the time. And there was excitement in all of us. There was eagerness to speak about Jesus and what that love, that cross did to all of us. Now let me encourage you, my dear brothers and sisters, let us continue. Let us continue that fire. Let us continue and in, infect so many people just like what the early Christians did. And let us also remember those who come before us. Let us also remember those brothers and sisters who are now gone, who did their part in sharing the gospel. Let us be encouraged by them. Let us be encouraged by their zealousness to the Lord. And let the next generation be also encouraged to your zealousness in the Lord. And let us be forever proud of our Lord Jesus Christ as we bear the name Christian. Because remember, we bear the name of Christ in our Christianity, for without Christ, I am nothing. It is because of that God's love. It is because that every week we remember Jesus Christ. At this very moment, the world remember the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, that every week we come together to remember him by taking the cup, 
by taking the bread. It's our manifestation showing to the world how Jesus loved you and I. And as we embrace that new life with Christ, remember that all of us being Christians, we bear the name Christian, and without Christ, we are nothing. And finally, let me leave you with this verse from Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. But if I say, I will never mention the Lord or speak in his name again, his word burns in my heart like a fire. It is like a fire in my bones. I am worn out trying to hold it in. I cannot do it. Brothers and friends, sisters, like Jeremiah, let's God's word the message of his love and salvation burns in our hearts, burns in our bones like a fire that we cannot just contain it, but to spread it. Let us be a man and women on fire for the Lord. God bless all of us. And may I ask the congregation to stand up as we sing the song of invitation. God bless all of you.